Welcome everyone, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all of those observing Ramadan. Um, we are so excited to have uh, Jeremy Sampson join us today. Some of you might remember him from our past session in person at Methil. He did come by and he, um, a little more about Jeremy, just to remind you guys, uh, he is a gardener and local food advocate for eight years, working with various organizations throughout Southern California, teaching gardening and urban farming. He and his partner, Christina, now live in Maine on a one acre homestead and are in the process of expanding the or orchard and uh, gardens while spending as much time as possible hanging out with their goats. All right, so you're, what would you call, you're a herder, Go, goat herder? A goat herd, yep. Mm -hmm. goat herd. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, welcome, Jeremy. It's so nice to have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I, I'm uh, happy to to be here and, and glad that we can kind of talk some, some gardening with everybody today. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to start with a short little video, a 15-minute video. Basically, I, I just kind of walked around uh, the property, pointing things out of either existing features or things that we're going to be working on and uh, talking about a little bit of our plans with uh, orchard gardening and then how we use our animals to help process a lot of that. And then uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit more. It sounded like there was more interest in some composting. So we can talk about composting and then uh, some some basic gardening tips as, as we kind of head into warmer weather and, uh, you know, obviously pertinent to Southern California, not so much here because that's not going to be very useful for you, but we can talk about um, things like, uh, you know, having uh, shade houses and what types of plants are best to be grown during the summer. So I will start with, I'm just going to start with this video. Let's see if I can share. Share sound. Okay. And uh, I'm going to set this, the sound kind of low to start us off here. Just to make sure because I don't want I don't want it too loud. Um, but if it's if it's not loud enough, just let me know and I can turn it up. Okay. And uh, here we go. Hi everyone. I'm Jeremy. Uh, it's good to see all of you again. We're going to be talking shortly uh, and I'll be able to answer some questions a little bit later on that you have. But first of all, I want to do a little bit of a tour of my home, a homestead that my wife and I are uh, working on right now in Maine. Um, it is a beautiful spring afternoon and I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour, kind of showing some of the things that uh, we already have in place some of the things that we want to establish soon, either this year or over the course of a few years. And then uh, our systems for managing a lot of the waste that we produce and how we, how we uh, process that through uh, with the animals that we have, as well as our composting. And then uh, after that, I can answer some more questions and we can get into some more detail about how those things might work for all of you at home. All right, so uh, first of all, I'm gonna go to the front yard and kind of show you some ideas that we have for uh, primarily where our orchard is gonna be. So we're traveling on the north side of the property right now. So I'm looking east and there's the road and driveway and everything and right there is our crab apple tree now that was there and is as you can see from the size quite established very old and what we're going to be doing is using that as a basis and then we're going to be putting trees kind of here and here and here kind of in a row and expanding out uh, in in two rows with a mixture of pear and apple trees um, making sure that we have different varieties so they'll have good pollination and they'll function as uh, fruit and also a little bit of screening and privacy from the road. And uh, so this will kind of be the, the front yard um, focal point with the orchard. We're hoping to have between 12 and 15 fruit trees in total and that will be over the course of a few years kind of planting, uh, planting them in small groups. 
And then we're going to probably transfer a lot of the rest of this lawn into uh, wildflowers. So we're going to try and make a, a meadow by um, planting native seeds and allowing native flowers to kind of take hold, going through and ripping up some of the uh, turf that's here along the way to make more room for that sort of thing. And then over here, and again, we're looking at the, we're looking north. So this is the beginnings of our greenhouse. I'm very excited about this. Now, bear with me, it's, things are a little bit messy. We're just getting out of winter, so doing a lot of uh, cleanup and that sort of thing. But, um, so we have the frame of a greenhouse now. We need to uh, set up the outside ends, essentially. That's what all that wood is. And then we will be able to have a, a nice uh, east to west orientation which means that one side of it will get sun, even during winter, even when uh, the, uh, the sun is low in the sky. And then during the summer, we'll be able to roll up the sides, either the backside, which is where most of our wind comes from, from the, uh, from the northwest and the northeast, or from the south um, to kind of let the sun get through um, the plastic a little bit more and, uh, and heat everything up. So I'm very excited about this. Um, I got the uh, frame last year and I'm about probably about a month away from being able to put anything in the ground because we're still a little bit under a frost, uh, frost risk right now. So that is going to be our annuals. So all of our vegetables, uh, some of our flowers, and uh, we're hoping to put in some herbs in there and extend our season. Um, that way we can actually grow instead of, instead of like June 1st to October 1st, we might be able to actually grow during, um, during May and then into potentially November uh, with this to keep the temperatures up. Next is we have our blueberry patch and then on the other side and I'm going to circle around so you can see it a little bit better But that is the back side of our compost bins on the other side. So these are our uh, high bush blueberries So these were established and already here when we bought the home and You can see that the uh, let's See if I can get my finger in the frame here. So this uh, section up here is for putting a mesh netting to protect the blueberries from birds and squirrels and that sort of thing. Uh, last summer, the blueberries were just ripening when we moved in and we didn't have a whole lot of problems with the birds. So uh, we're also not entirely upset if the birds are eating some of our stuff because we want to provide for them as well. And we have uh, already kind of started to put some of our barn bedding down among the uh, blueberry bushes as a mulch and fertilizer. So that will kind of be a very slow composting process. We started our garlic. So we can already see that they're starting to come up. Little garlic plants. Very excited about this. This is the first time that I've grown garlic. And these actually go in, in uh, the Northeast. We actually plant these things in November, just before the frost. And then we cover them. As you can see, we have more of that uh, bedding mulch just removed it yesterday and they uh they sit in the ground over winter and then in the spring we uncover them and then they start growing and then we harvest in uh in uh, late summer usually usually uh august time period let me spin around real quick to show you the compost bin. this is brand new just using some pallets this is a pretty common application of a compost bin. You put it in the first one. So this is the, the rawest stuff. So that's going to be a combination of some of our bedding from our goats, uh, our chicken poop, our uh, kitchen scraps, and that sort of thing. And then as it breaks down, you can move what's in this one to the second one. And it gets a little bit smaller. And then finally, once it's broken down enough, you move it to that one to the third one. And that is what we were we would use for our garden. Uh, and we're, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be producing enough mm -hmm. compost for it as a uh, bit of a soil supplement. Um, we won't be able to fill our raised beds or anything with it, but this, um, this system is, is pretty standard and it allows us to uh, hold uh, almost three yards 
of compost at a time. And during the winter, uh, the other thing that we're going to do adding to this compost is we do have a wood stove, so we're going to be adding ash to it. Uh, the ash is really rich in, um, in carbon and, uh, and sorry, uh, phosphorus and uh, potassium. So we're going to be able to kind of put that in as an additive into the compost and mix it in and uh, improve, improve that soil. So behind me is uh, the wonderful <laughs> responsibility of a homeowner. Uh, this is all trimmings. <laughs> so most of it is from the trees on the property. We have a couple magnolias. Uh, you can see this large gouge over here. We lost a limb off this maple. Um, so you can kind of see right there, um, this past winter it was really windy, so that blew down and kind of broke it up, cutting it down into pieces. So this is a, from all of our trimming. So this is uh, behind us is a grape, uh, grape trellis. So there's uh, three different types of grapes on there and it's quite nice underneath it in the summer with the shade. So this pile is essentially from our apple trees here in the back, and I'll show you in just a second. From our grapes, uh, from the magnolias in the front, our lilacs, and then finally um, we have mixed in here, we have some spruce and some pine. So uh, the goats really like eating spruce and pine as a treat. So uh, when I have tree trimmings at work or um, around Christmas time, we actually took some people uh, had some trees fall because of the wind. The same store that, that knocked down that uh, maple limb, some people lost some spruce. So I would pick it up, bring it over here, we feed the goats, and then we create this uh, kind of brush pile. And then once or twice a year, we can do a little bit of a bonfire. You can see right there, that was the remains of the one we did in, uh, in December just before the frost, and we'll be able to mix that in with the compost and the garden to improve uh, the nutrient profile. I want to show you real quick, a little bit closer with the, uh, with the grapevines. So we've got some irrigation tubing, so that way we can just connect to the hose and it will uh, provide water um, right to the bases, right about there and right here and uh, drip irrigation essentially, and it will provide it directly to the roots. Unfortunately, we also lost one of our chickens last year and he is buried here as well. Um, so he's gonna be helping to feed our, uh, our grapes this year. Uh, very unfortunate that we lost him, but we are returning him to the earth. So that's kind of the, uh, the grape trellis, provides some nice shade during the summer. All right, last couple features. So we've got our two apple trees back here, trimming those down. They were in real bad shape. Um, they're a little bit too tall, but you can't trim them back too much each year. So this will be like a two or three year process, bringing these down. All right, and I'm gonna just kind of spin around this way. This area here collects a lot of water. So we might open it up a little bit and put in a small pond for retaining water in the spring. We've got our chicken run, so our chickens, this is there in the corner, that is Joni, and she's a troublemaker. When we first got her, she took off and ran, and the poor woman that we bought them from had to chase her down. <laughs> and uh, we've got a mix of, we've got nine chickens total. They give us white, brown, blue, green, and dark olive uh, colored eggs. They're beautiful. And what they also do in here, and you can kind of see, maybe a little bit, you see they're uh, right there, they're kind of digging a little bit of a hole and on this side. So we take our goat bedding, which is some wood shavings and hay and then their goat poop and urine. Well, we toss it in here and the chickens will go through it and they kind of mix it up and, and they poop in it and they eat the bugs that are in it and then I can scrape this out and this will be the foundation for our compost. So it will be very rich in carbon, which is uh, the wood shavings and the hay and nitrogen, which is the chicken poop. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. And then finally, we have our barn and our goat run and our goats. And they are awesome. This is Delilah. 
Hey mama, this is Delilah. She's our, she's our baby girl. Um, this is Pickle. And then this is Doug. Doug, Pickle, and Delilah. Yes, I see you. So, uh, they will be, um, they, they are fed hay, uh, which we buy locally. They do eat some grain. And then, of course, uh, you can see some of the uh, tree trimmings that we've got. So, we've got some, some pine and some spruce tossed in there. So, they eat those as treats. And... So they can help process some of our uh, tree waste, which is pretty nice. They provide poop, which is actually pretty easy to manage um, because it's nice little pellets. Hey guys. And uh, so they'll be able to, that poop will be able to be um, turned into the compost to provide nutrients for our garden. And then uh, the other nice thing is that we do have some fencing and you can see on the other side, we've got some fencing. I had to replace this fence just the other day because <laughs> they were breaking out of it. Um, we can uh, put them out here in the rest of the yard and they can eat a little bit of the grass out here and kind of keep it down, but they can also pee and poop out in the grass. Uh, so we don't have to fertilize. They actually will help do that for us. Um, and we're also planning on, uh, mating Delilah this fall and, uh, for milking purposes. So we might have, uh, a couple, um, probably one or two, uh, kids this time next year. At least that's our hope. And we'll give our, uh, we'll give it a try on milking goats for the first time, which we're very excited about and hopefully, uh, turning that into cheese. But these are all challenges that uh, we're, we're excited about, but still very nervous because um, we're kind of doing all of this for the first time. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So that's kind of our that's kind of our landscape and, and the things that we have going on, some of the plans that we have uh, for the future. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to myself and um, we can kind of go into more detail about the different things that I was uh, pointing out and talking about. And then I'm happy to answer any questions either uh, about the landscapes that I was showing you or simply um, simply any other gardening questions that you might have. Okay. All right. There we go. <laughs> Did everybody hear okay? Is that all right? Okay, good. Perfect. Um, so the first thing that I want to do, actually, and I want to, I'll bring this up uh, first, because we'll talk a little bit more about the composting. Let's see if I can get that, uh, get this photo up real quick. go there we'll share that right there um so with our with our composting at home uh we are as i pointed out we're doing you know a lot of the uh the bedding from the goats and uh with the chickens so that's kind of the basis of our uh, of our nitrogen and carbon. So in, in kind of the breakdown of, of compost, you have greens, which is your nitrogen, and then your browns, which is your carbon. And you want a, a pretty even uh, mix between those two things. You, you want roughly like a 50-50 mix between your, your greens and your browns. Um, now, keep in mind that is not necessarily by volume. So the like the hay and the wood shavings that we use as the bedding uh, takes up a lot more space, but the uh, specifically the like the chicken, uh, the chicken manure is incredibly high in nitrogen. So it doesn't take a whole lot of the chicken manure to be added um, to the uh, to the hay and, and the wood shavings to make it roughly 50 50 as far as like the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you can go a little bit higher on the browns, the carbon. Uh, it just takes longer to break down. Though the higher you are on the browns, it's also much less risk of it smelling. 
you tend to have a lot of problems with um, with pests and smell when you have too much of the green of the nitrogen mixed in. That's generally um, what you need to worry about. So, so for us, we're adding a, a little bit of grass clippings because I, I do mow um, a portion of the front lawn. Uh, definitely the fruit and vegetable scraps that we generate in our kitchen. Uh, the bread and grains, again, kind of kitchen scraps. Uh, we do have coffee grounds, which will be added. And then the uh, the hair and fur, we don't really, aren't going to really add anything like that to it, but it will be the, uh, the manures that we get from both the goats and the chickens. For our browns will be leaves and uh, twigs. We probably won't be using any newspaper or cardboard or uh, or any clean paper. But for those of you that, that have extra uh, materials like that, that would be great for you. Um, we don't really get a newspaper, but for our browns, we have our, our bedding. And then we will be adding some of the smaller twigs and branches. And then as you can see here on the bottom, those fireplace ashes. So for, uh, for us, because of our soil type, we need to be a little bit more concerned about the uh, potassium and phosphorus content. So adding that ash into the compost pile is kind of a necessity. In your climate, in the soil in Southern California, you don't need to worry about that as much um, because the soil is a lot more rich in minerals uh, than it is here. So. Uh, but those are kind of your your breakdowns between the different types of things that you can add into a compost. The big, big thing, though, is there are some things that you should not add. Uh, the big ones are going to be uh, dairy, so either milk or cheese. Anything uh, from a an animal source like, um, you know, meat, fat, oil, or bones, you don't want to throw any of that in there. Um, those things will attract more pests but they will also stink and then they can also be vectors for uh, diseases and um, and things like that which you don't want to mess with so you want to be careful with that uh, same thing goes for pet waste so we do have uh, a few cats at home but all of that is disposed separately we don't put that in a compost um, seafood scraps is going to be kind of similar to uh, to bones obviously we don't want to add any plastic uh, to our compost because that's going to be going into our garden uh, or uh, metals glass or and this is kind of important the treated or painted wood because the 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 chemicals in, in uh, treated wood and paint is what we want to avoid. Um, untreated wood, on the other hand, you can compost it. It will break down uh, without too much of an issue. It'll just be more, more time um, to do so than smaller items. So I wanted to do that real quick um, since we were on that subject and it was mentioned that there was interest in that. As far as the... Um, as far as the design for a compost pile now, I have the space and I also have the materials to require th a three bin system. Um, I'm going to be putting in many, many yards of, uh, of barn bedding and, and other uh, waste in the yard, as well as a lot of uh, kitchen scraps. Those of you that don't have animals like I do probably don't need that much space and you can get away with a single location for your compost and you can just kind of rotate it uh, in that small spot. So if you have a few pallets, you can do it. There's some really uh, cool, they're called little earth machines. So they're kind of like plastic containers uh, with domes with, with closable lids that can help keep pests out. Some of you have probably seen these before. Uh, there are also some barrels that are mounted that make it easy to rotate in the air, just kind of spinning a handle. Again, those uh, are nice for smaller amounts of waste and for keeping pests out of them. Um, and that's a, you know, a bigger concern in more urban environments. Uh, for me, there's no way I'm going to be able to keep more, most of the pets out regardless <laughs> of what I have. Uh, if they really want to get to something, they will. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that we provide enough uh, out there so they don't have to come to, to take our stuff, essentially. 
So, um, so those are some considerations as far as the uh, as far as the compost is concerned. Does anybody have any questions pertaining to the compost? And the other thing is, uh, if if you would like, um, definitely feel free to to put up any questions in the chat. So that way, uh, I can kind of we kind can look through those. And I, I apologize that I didn't mention that before. Um, but if you do have any, feel free to uh, to put them up there and I can answer them as I go through. Um, so were there any questions about the, uh, the composting? Uh, I noticed that you had fruit and vegetables uh, in both the green and the do not add. Uh, there's some, uh, it's the uh, stickers from the fruits and vegetables that we want to oh, avoid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, make sure that you're, uh, you know, like the little stickers that go on the bananas or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. We want to take those off and throw them in the trash and uh, because they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't go into the compost. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question okay. about this barrel uh, composting mechanism. How long does it take for one uh, eel to be ready? Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on, there's a lot of different factors. Um, there is uh going to be it's going to be dependent on the types of materials that you're throwing into it in the first place so if they're all very small then it it generally goes faster if it's warmer it's going to go faster um so and, and depending on the time of year so during the summer it will generally break down a little bit faster than it will during the winter uh so oh, oh see one of my cats knew i was talking about him um the the other thing is uh, how often you're adding to it. So there, there are some, uh, some people out there that can make uh, a yard of compost, like a, a cubic yard, so a three foot by three foot by three foot cube. Um, they can process that waste into compost in like three months. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not that good. So it usually takes me like six to eight months. Um, here in Maine, it will probably take me close to a year um, because things go relatively inactive during the winter because of the cold. So in the barrel systems, I would plan on probably a, a six, six month turnaround once you get it full. Uh, so once you, you have put enough waste in it, so it's, it's relatively full and then you're turning it you know, whenever that might be, it might be, uh, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, um, something like that. It, it, it does take a little bit of time for that to happen. Uh, but the barrel systems, especially with the ability to turn it, uh, can speed that process up. Another really easy thing to do is uh, you can just like bury it. If you have room in your yard, you can just kind of bury that stuff and it will turn to compost over the course of a year or two. Uh, and you don't have to uh, work at it um, or if you have the space you can just make a pile and it will break down over time but it could take several years for it to uh, to do it in that way so yeah, so I, ho I hope that kind of answers I know that's not a, as specific as you'd probably like but um, because there's a lot of variables that go into it it's it's usually between six months and a year okay that's a long process I thought it would like <laughs> it <laughs> So you can't if you're if you're very active and um, and you balance like the, those different types of materials in uh, well, then you can get it down to about a three month cycle. Um, but it it it's not an easy thing to do to get it down in in uh, down to compost that quickly. It, it is um, it's something that you really have to dedicate some time to. <laughs> in order to do uh, to hurry it up once once it's ready and when you remove it you'll still have some freshly added material in it right so do you uh, separate you will it? yep and and that's that's going to be basically kind of the start of your next compost um so that's that's a big part of uh when i was showing you kind of my my three um my three bin uh system the idea is that that first one is always going to be having things added to it. So, you know, every, probably every few days, whenever we have kitchen scraps, it's going to go out there. And then maybe once a month when we clean out the barn, uh, we'll be adding things in. Whatever is ready, then we'll move into the second one. 
and the things that are still fresh we'll keep in the first one and then the second one will kind of go through that process as well over the course of several months and then whatever's ready will move into the third one leaving behind that kind of like mid um mid uh broken down material so it's just kind of like an ongoing cycle of of new uh new pro uh, waste product to kind of partially broken down into the completed compost and and how deep um, the um, material has to be if you do it in the ground uh if you bury it in the ground if you if you put six inches over it it doesn't have to be very deep um the biggest concern for doing something like that is making sure that you're not allowing pests to get to it so if you have uh you know if, if there are dogs or if you have like larger um pests like raccoons or something like that you need to go down a little bit deeper because they will dig uh they will dig for it and kind of drag it out and, and they'll they'll eat at it <laughs> um but if you only have things like possums or fruit rats and that sort of thing, usually six inches is all you need because they, they won't really dig down uh, that far to get to it. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. If you have, I have, I have just an idea. I'm sharing it with you. I have, I, that was my idea which I did in the backyard. We uh, dug two pits side by side. And in one pit, you go on filling whatever your waste is. And every time you put that, whatever earth you have dug out, you just layer it and cover it up so that you don't have any smell coming up. So by the time this gets filled in, you start filling up the next one. By the, you know, what, uh, and the other one gets filled. By that time, this one is done. You know what I mean? When you fill up one, the other one is empty over there. You know, when this gets filled up, you start filling the other one. By the time the other one gets filled up, the first one is ready for you. So you, can, <laughs> you can open it and see if it is, you know, you can open it and see and if it has turned black in color, that means it's showing that it has started rotting, then it's ready for use. But that's how you can use, um, if you have two, uh, two pits, maybe yep. three feet by three feet and you go deep down as much as you can. Yeah, that is that is exactly right. That is a great way to do it, where you kind of have one that is slowly breaking down over time while you're filling the next one, and then you can go back and and uh, dig it back up once it's done, and just kind of uh, swap back and forth, and can can keep that kind of going continuously. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Do we need to add something else to it other than all these uh, the brown and the green? Uh, no. Nope, that's that's it. Um, the the biggest thing is that the the more greens that you add, the faster it will break down. But the but you have to be careful with uh, the uh, the smell a little bit. The only other thing that I can think of that you might have to add, and this is specifically during uh, the summer and the fall, is a little bit of water because a compost pile that is above ground anyway. Uh, in a barrel or in an earth machine or anything like that will tend to dry out because of the heat and uh, the wind, especially with the Santa Ana's uh, in the fall. So you may have to add a little bit of water um, to the compost pile to keep everything active, keep all the, the, uh, the bacteria and everything, microbes uh, going to um, keep that process going. Uh, the best way to do that is to put a hose kind of on the top with a very slow trickle, just a, just a small little drip and uh, keep it on there for like an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and then uh, turn it off and then check to see where the moisture is. If it's, so, if it's seeping through and soaking, then you've, you've, done, um, you've done it correctly. And then uh, if you need a little bit more or a little bit less, a little bit less is nice. You just kind of turn everything so the, uh, so the, the water can dry out a little bit. If you need a little bit more, you can just add some water, uh, you know, a little bit more water either that day or the next day and, and keep it going. So, yep. But that's pretty much it. Uh, composting is, is very simple. <laughs> um, it just, the, it gets complicated with how quickly you want to do it not necessarily if you want to do it in the first place. So How do we this, instead of putting it in the pit, why don't we dig something around the around the plant itself and put all your like fruit shavings or whatever whatever your scraps and what you have you put them all there and just cover it with dirt. Won't it uh, become compost and feed the plant? 
It, it can, um, but you need to be careful with uh, what you're putting in there. So in some cases, your, uh, your compost might have, uh, might have like mildew or something like that on it. If you're bringing things from the kitchen, it might have already started to rot. So it has mold and that sort of thing. You don't want to put that in with living plants. So you want that to break down um, in the compost before adding it. The other thing is, is um, unless you are doing it with a like a perennial, something like a fruit tree, there's a very high risk of damaging the plant's roots while you're digging, which will hurt the plant. And most likely that that um, that waste won't break down fast enough to provide anything to like if you're doing it for like a tomato or a pepper or broccoli or something like that. Um, on the other hand, if you do have an established fruit tree, uh, you know, a lime, a lemon, uh, anything like that year after year with, with good solid roots, digging small holes uh, around the perimeter uh, at the drip line. So the drip line is kind of the edges of the canopy, right? Where the, the farthest leaves and branches reach out. If you dig small holes uh, around that drip line and put in that uh, food waste and things and let it break down, that would work um, because the amount of roots that you're damaging in that process is minimal. It's a well-established tree and it will be around long enough to benefit once all of those things break down into compost. So that certainly is a, a possibility for uh, fruit trees. Yep. So I have, uh, let's see here, I have a question. Can you talk about what plants to include in a shade house? Also, can we plant vegetables in metal bins if we don't have much dirt in our patio or yard? So as far as uh, plants to include in a shade house, um, during the summer, <laughs> uh, most of your vegetables and things will do just fine in something with uh, shade cloth over it. So you can grow tomatoes, peppers, squash, cucumbers, that sort of thing. And uh, as long as they're getting full sun, as in they're getting, uh, you know, like a full day's worth of sun, but maybe not that direct heat um, because of the shade cloth, then they'll do just fine. And the other nice thing about the shade cloth is that it helps cool down the ambient temperature. So you can get away with doing uh, more of the like the tender type plants uh, like your tomatoes and peppers are generally very tough uh, they tolerate high heat and they can do pretty well in full sun but things like um, one of my favorites to grow is basil uh, basil has a really hard time surviving in uh, in July and August uh, it tends to get really woody bitter and then it, it starts to flower um, but if you have shade, uh, shade cloth, it tends to last a little bit longer and it's easier to, uh, to keep healthy and, and tasting um, good. So that's, uh, that's kind of what you can do in the shade uh, as far as like vegetables and things like that. Almost anything. During the winter, though, if you want to grow during the winter, I would suggest uh, either removing the shade cloth or planting in another place because uh, the winter um, sun isn't as intense. And most of the things that you'd be growing in the winter, your, your broccolis, your lettuce, uh, carrots, Brussels sprouts, anything like that, um, will need that sun and, and can handle um, the more mild temperatures pretty well. Um, and then the other thing with metal bins, you want to be very careful with metal uh, because it does absorb a lot of heat. Now, if you're going to use... Um, uh, metal anything to plant in, make sure that they are either a reflective color or a light color. And this is true of any type of pot, whether uh, it's, it's metal, plastic, terracotta, anything like that. You want to make sure that they are lighter colored because they will reflect that heat instead of absorbing it. And the roots won't burn, um, in, especially during the summer if, you're, uh, if the pots get really, really hot, the roots will die in that soil. And it will be very difficult for you to keep that soil with enough water in it because it will evaporate much faster. So metal bins are totally fine to use. Uh, just make sure that you're using either reflective or light colors. And then as is true with any type of container, you will need to add uh, more water 
to it to uh, to keep it from drying out because they do tend to dry out a little bit faster than uh, planting in the ground. So um, trying to think of the other thing with uh, with containers, the other thing to consider is because you're watering more, um, you want to make sure that you are fertilizing more because as the water kind of trickles through, uh, a lot of it will kind of drain out the bottom and with it, uh, some of the nutrients. So on occasion, you will have to add, uh, you know, either a, a specific fertilizer um, for whatever you might growing. And they have different fertilizers for flowers or vegetables and that sort of thing. Or, uh, and this is, this is what I like to use, is, is just a little bit of compost. So on a regular basis, maybe once a week, sprinkle a little bit of compost on the top. And as you're watering, the nutrients on the top will get washed down deeper and deeper towards the roots, and it will tend to get used up a little bit uh, better than fertilizer. So just something to keep in mind. One question. Um, mm -hmm. Planting your plants in the planter with, uh, you know, you have a tray underneath the container. So when you're watering, the water goes in the tray, so you're not watering pre uh, frequently. Mm -hmm. And that keeps all the nutrition in the soil. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Uh, okay. So you won't. Yep. You won't lose. Um, you won't lose as much water. You won't lose as many nutrients like that. Nutrients. Yep. Right. That's that's right. So you, you'll uh, you won't have to water or fertilize Thank as you. often. Right. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. When we use eggshells uh, yep. in the water for the like the. Um, for the plants, like to, um, for the vegetables, or is that just for like greenhouse plant type things? Uh, so the only thing that I would suggest using them for, and there's uh, there's two things that you wanna do. So um, for eggshells, make sure that you clean them out. Uh, so you're, you're washing them and then you are removing the film that's on the inside. And then, uh, and then you want to make sure they're dried and then crush them up. So you just, you want to be careful with that because you, they can be a vector for things like salmonella and you don't want to put that oh. in with, in, in with your vegetables, but uh, cleaning them out, will do it. That will clean them. Um, you know, that will make them safe and drying them out will be fine. You can crush them up. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the one thing that I would recommend uh, rec recommend them for are tomatoes specifically, because tomatoes are notorious for having calcium deficiencies. And you will get something called blossom end rot. Uh, it's a very common tomato problem where the, you know, the bottom of the tomato where the blossom was uh, tends to turn black and then caves in. And it is, it is a direct symptom of not enough calcium. So, uh, but absolutely, you can use them in that. Uh, they are also good for um, putting in with uh, roses. So uh, the calcium, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how it helps the roses, but uh, eggshells and things uh, do quite well with that. Yeah, my mom used to use that for her roses. And yep. I didn't know what else she used them for. I never asked her, but now I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you you what can about, definitely add that uh, add that in. Okay. What about banana skin and fish fertilizer for uh, for your flowers and all that? I've been using that and it's giving me good good of everything. Yeah. Uh, so banana peels are really good in potassium and phosphorus. So both of those things are good for, so potassium is good for roots. Phosphorus is good for flowers. So uh, banana peels are, are great. Um, what I would recommend in that is, you know, cutting them up into smaller pieces because they'll break down faster. But you can mm -hmm. absolutely use those uh, both in a compost or other, other types of um, uh, plantings. Mm -hmm. And sorry, what was the other thing that you said? The uh, the fish emulsion fish or fish fertilizer? fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fish yep. Fish. So basically, uh, a lot of that is just kind of like waste product from processing fish. So it's going to be their you know bones and fat and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it it is in that form. It has been processed to be safe. Uh, so it is fine to use. Uh, generally speaking, they are very high in nitrogen. So nitrogen mm -hmm. is what's going to give you um, a lot of like leafy green growth. Um, so it helps, it helps with that sort of thing. So I got what another about, question. Um, Go ahead. Oh, let me ask you real quick about coffee grinds. I have, mm -hmm. my mom used to use those too, but I don't remember what for. Everything. Uh, yeah, everything. 
they're fantastic for everything. They um, okay. They have they have a little bit of nutrient value uh, in them, but really the biggest thing is because because it's uh, this really nice granule. Um, mm -hmm. It helps break up the soil. Worms really like them, uh, so they tend to like eat them and process that. So that's really great, and uh, just kind of improves the soil in general. There is a, a okay. small amount of I think it's I think it's nitrogen. Um, that's in it that will uh, kind of help your plants. It's not really a lot, but th coffee grounds are fantastic. So yes, okay. uh, like add them to your garden. And what's nice about coffee grounds is you can just kind of sprinkle them anywhere you want. You don't have to worry about um, anything. Uh, yeah. Insect or anything. Yeah, and, and they tend to uh, repel some insects as well because the smell. Yeah. So I do have okay. a question in the chat real quick. So um, it was about... Uh, Things so for beginners, what um, what I would suggest to plant uh, and how much to water. So beginner, right now, let's see, we're go we're about midway through April. So right now, the best thing to plant is going to be a tomato. And if you don't have, uh, even if you don't have a lot of space. Go to your big box store and get a five-gallon bucket. <laughs> Buy a bag of um, of like container gardening soil, and then make sure you take that bucket home and you drill just a small little quarter-inch okay. hole about two inches off the bottom of that bucket. So that's mm -hmm. just in case that you know the water stays put and it can drain off if need be. And throw a tomato plant in there and uh, water it all that you want because that drainage will, <laughs> will help. Um, and the biggest thing to pay attention for with, uh, with a tomato in that situation is during the day, at the hottest part of the day, th the, the leaves and everything will droop, right? So they're, they're, they're just going to look real bad. Um, if, as it cools off, as the sun sets and the temperature starts to drop, if the leaves don't perk up again, then it needs water. If they stay droopy, then you need to water. But if they perk up, they're okay. And uh, so that's kind of like the biggest thing to, to look for. Um, the, one of the easiest things to grow in Southern California, especially uh, at this time of year. And you'll, you'll get uh, some pretty good um, tomatoes out of something like that. And it doesn't take a whole lot of space. Five-gallon bucket is all that you need to grow uh, a tomato plant. So... That's, that's what I would suggest. And just watch the plant. Um, they, they, uh, the plants talk to you. They don't talk like people or animals do, but, but they give you information. And if you know how, what to look for, they'll tell you, um, you know, if they need more water or if they need more fertilizer, things like yellow leaves or purple leaves will tell you that you need uh, some more calcium or nitrogen uh, to, uh, to help them out. So, yep, it's, they're just, just listen to the plant. <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you what you need. <laughs> well, I have a question. Normally when people water by through their hose, you know, not realizing the water in the hose is hot during the summertime. Mm -hmm. They actually kill the plant when they're watering late in the afternoon. So basically you got to rinse out the hose and see, wait till the water is cooled off and then spring, you know, spray over all your vegetables. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's very, especially if your hose is sitting out in the sun Some all day. Water. So it, it might be over, you know, just despite it might only be, you know, in the 80s or 90s um, during the day, that hose might be well over 100 degrees, 100 with, degrees. with the uh, temperatures it's picking up. So the water that's coming out of there is very hot and you're absolutely right. It can, um, it can kill a plant. So, so here's what I recommend. If you got your compost pile going on, uh, your first uh, flush through that hose is going into your compost pile. Um, so that's the hot water and it's not going to hurt anything in there. It'll keep your uh, compost nice and nice and wet and, and breaking down. And then once it starts to cool off, then you can turn it over to the rest of your garden and your flowers and your tomatoes and, and whatever else you might be growing. But absolutely, that's, that's a very good point. Hmm. What do you apply for aphids on your rose buds? Uh, so... Different... Go ahead. Yep, so... So the aphids, I uh, I don't 
tend to use any chemicals in my yeah. gardens. Yeah. Um, so things like things like your uh, your aphids, I generally try and use a spray of water. Mm -hmm. um, if I notice that they're really bad, mm -hmm. then I'll I'll probably just pull out that plant because um, it yeah. means that plant isn't fighting back because they they do they do resist they do put out chemicals and things that will fight against uh, an infestation like that. If the plant is just covered in aphids, then that plant isn't good there, and I'll just get rid of it. Uh, and hopefully the other plants will be able to uh, to do a little bit better, but. For something like aphids, uh, a blast of water is good, and yeah. just make sure to get the undersides of the leaves because that's where most of them are going to be. That's the most protected part of a plant. So using a, a spray of water on the leaves will uh, will clean off a lot of it. Um, I'm trying to think of like use a brush to brush them. I off tried the using uh, neem brush. oil mm -hmm. and vinegar and sprayed the whole plant when it was effect, affected, you know, mm -hmm. with and that kind of worked for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then when it was working, I chopped off the tree into half to get new blooms. So mm -hmm. they became healthier. So I used neem oil and I used vinegar with water. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, I was just about to suggest neem oil is pretty great. Um, it's, it's a pretty safe, uh, oil to use as well. Like it's not very toxic, um, but it does work pretty well on it. And actually a lot of different insects. So you can use it for aphids. It also, I think, uh, is effective against things like scale. Um, so those, you know, the little black shelled, uh, things that kind of latch onto, um, specifically they, a, a lot of times they'll be on roses, uh, that sort of thing or apple trees. So, um, it will work with that as well. And, Even the uh, eggplant, you know, sometimes the leaves become like a furry kind of a fungus, mm -hmm. kind of a whiteness on the leaves of mm -hmm. the plant. It also works on mm -hmm. that too. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. it, yeah, it would help with, um, so that would probably be a combination of the, uh, the aphids and then maybe something like whitefly. Uh, so whitefly does Correct. tend to leave kind of that, like that white powder, white powder um, behind. Leaves. Yep, mm -hmm. right. exactly. Yep. So yeah, neem oil, is, neem oil is a great suggestion. How do you spell that? N-E-E-M. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's all? Yep, that's it. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yep, it's from the neem tree. tree. You know? Neem leaves tree. Yep. Hmm. All so, right. in your, so in your gardening process, you don't use any chemicals that are harmful to environment? And, and Not for... Plant Especially pests. For grapes, you know, grapes are so hard without. Uh... Uh, so, yeah, so my grapes, uh, so here I don't have to worry about a lot of the things that I did in California um, because it's a little colder. But uh, the, the grapes in um, neem oil is going to work on a lot of the things for grapes as well. The other option is there are some, uh, because grapes are perennial, so they have deeper roots. There are some treatments depending on the problem that you have. And we're, I, I don't want to get too deep into it because integrated pest management is like a, this whole big thing. <laughs> that, um, but they, there are uh, specific products for things like uh, fruit trees and grapes. And what they're called is uh, a, a drench. They're drenches. So you mix them with water and then you soak the ground around the plant, usually, uh, usually a little bit earlier than this. So you probably want to do this in uh, January, February time frame before everything starts leafing out. But what it will do is the, the rest of the, the plant will kind of draw it up through the roots and up through. And then when the leaves uh, start to grow, that chemical will be in the leaf. Now, if you're planning on eating from this plant, you need to make sure that the, the uh, product that you select is safe for that purpose. And there's generally a, a harvest period after application that you have to wait. It's it's generally like two or three months. Um, so you want to make sure that if you if you are going to use it, that you are not harvesting from it or not eating from that plant for, you know, at least that amount of time, probably longer, just to make sure that you're not ingesting that chemical. But it does work from the inside of the plant and helps prevent um, infestations of uh, whitefly, which is a really big one, as well as um, thrips 
and uh, the, uh, the, the, what are they called? The glasswing sharpshooter, which is the thing that kind of spreads a lot of diseases for, uh, for grapes. So something like that. So what, that's what you're looking for is more of a drench in that case. Yeah, I have a question regarding grapes. Mm -hmm. Can you transplant an adult grape plant if you want to change the location, if you want to put it somewhere mm -hmm. else? You, uh, you absolutely can. Um, it is going to be a little bit difficult, but you can. The biggest thing to do is make sure that you're getting as much of the root as possible. So you're, you know, try not to cut any roots and that might mean digging out six or six to ten feet because you know depending on how established it is you want to grab as much as as much as possible um but uh the other big thing is once you have it and you transplant it make sure that you uh you're keeping the soil uh damp because you've damaged all of the roots so it's not going to be able to pull up water as quickly and the other thing is you probably want to chop it back to almost just a stump uh, you don't want to have, uh, you know, more than maybe two or three feet of vine above, because if it has anything more than that, the roots are going to spend all of its energy trying to keep that alive and they won't establish. So moving, moving a fully grown established anything is risky. Uh, there's always a risk of it not being able to uh, survive that, uh, that transplant, but that's how you do it. Keep as much of the root as you can and chop it back. So that way it can focus on establishing new roots instead of having to keep the, the rest of the plant alive. What would be the right season, right time before winter or what? Yes. Um, yep. So uh, you want you you want to do it um, once it once all the leaves uh, dry died off. That would be the time to do it. So that's going to be probably yeah November December uh, time frame um, when it is uh, dormant. Thank you. All right, we're at 12 noon. One last question before we wrap up, but I am so impressed with all the, all the <laughs> interest and experts. Go ahead, Sister Zarina. Um, one question. I have a lot of blooms on my, banana, on my mango tree. Mm -hmm. And through a good friend of mine, I found out that I can, you know, to get it into fruit, you know, the blooms of mango, into food, mango food is to spray Epsom salt. Is that true? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that one. Uh, I'm not too familiar with mango trees. Um, as far as yeah, as far as the pollination, I'm not not sure what the Epsom salt would do. Uh, it might be so. Es Epsom salt, I believe, does have some phosphorus in it. Mm -hmm. uh, or or potassium, so that might that might be something that triggers. But I, I actually I don't know for sure. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. No Thank you. Can I have one last question, Zena? All right, I'll be nice. <laughs> well, as long as Jeremy's okay with it. We oh yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yep, go go for it. <laughs> you know, I would like to plant some fruit trees in my yard for California, Southern California. What is the good time to plant? Uh, uh, best time to plant fruit trees is going to be November or December. So that is when most things are going dormant uh, for the winter. So um, you also have the benefit of cooler temperatures. So it's less stress on the plant. And then also hopefully you're getting rain. Uh, so that will help um, with those new roots establishing. And that, that, is, um, that is true of basically every perennial plant that you're going to put in, whether whether it's roses or a mango tree or a lime tree, um, a fig or grapes or anything like that, your, your best time to do that is going to be late in the year um, as it's cooling off and everything is kind of going dormant for the winter. Thank you. You're very and, welcome. <laughs> and your compost will be ready by then too. And your compost will be ready, yeah, in the spring. Just you know, as soon as those uh, leaves start going out, you can lay the compost uh, on the top of the soil around them. Yes, <laughs> That's right. Let's go for it. <laughs> yes, yes. No, and, and and you know, this is so inspiring to see everyone's interest in gardening, and you know, it inspiring the non gardeners in the room to really, you know, get up and. Even like you said, plant a tomato tree. That's uh, that's a good starting goal. And can you do that right now, Jeremy? Uh, yes, you, absolutely. Yep, now's the right time to do it uh, is, is to yeah. get those tomatoes started. Yep. Great. 
So without uh, taking too much of your time again, thank you everyone for thank attending. You. Thank you, Jeremy, for your time. Um, I know you're in East Coast time. So what time is it there? Like three? Uh, it's about three o'clock. Yep. Three yep. o'clock. Okay. Yep. Well, I hope you have a good rest of the day. I apologize if I said good morning and not good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. It was nice to, nice to see some gentlemen in the room. So thank you, Brother Shabir and Brother Sami, for attending for a little bit. And we'll see you tomorrow then. Thank you, yep. Jeremy. You're thank very you. welcome. Take care, everyone. Right. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. All of Community Services is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Southern California that provides culturally appropriate services to seniors, their family, and the community. Through its physical and virtual interactive programs, Olive engages participants in a variety of ways that promotes health and well being. To learn more about Olive Community Services, to get involved, or to make a donation, please visit www.olivecs.org or email info at olivecs.org. Be a change maker and together, let's live, learn and thrive.